On this last program, we feature very poignant one-on-one -on -one interviews with members of our special Columbine discussion panel in an effort to gain more personal insight into the experiences each of my guests had, not only at the time of the attack, but during the intervening two decades. Welcome to the show. I'm with Kiki Leba, who was a teacher at Columbine in 1999. Kiki, thank you so much for joining me. Great to be here. So uh, obviously you have a different perspective. I know that, that you really helped a lot of kids. Uh, in the movie, by the way, you are just fabulous. I was just Thank you. very impressed with how thoughtful you've continued uh, to help people. What, what, is your, what has your journey been like since Columbine? Uh, well, yeah, I'm still there. I'm, uh, I'm still in the classroom. And the journey has just, it's, that's really, I mean, a great description of it. It has been so unexpected, the, the things that this has led to. And initially, it was a really difficult thing to come back from. Uh, it really impacted me, and I battled pretty severe PTSD and uh, symptoms for quite a few years, and uh, tried to kind of hide those uh, quite a bit. I alluded to it in the film. And, uh, and then finally made, uh, made uh, contact with a great trauma therapist and just made all the difference. And, Eventually, the, uh, uh, I, my experience led me to working with other communities who've been through gun violence. Uh, my son, Lucas, was in a middle, Deer Creek Middle School in 2010 when a gunman opened, up, opened fire outside the school. So our family has been through two school shootings, and, which is unimaginable and crazy, but uh, it's, it's just been such a part of our, our fabric of our life. And, uh, when the Sandy, Sandy Hook school shootings uh, happened, uh, that really impacted me significantly. But uh, two months later, I was sitting around a table with a bunch of Sandy Hook school teachers. So you went to Newtown? I went to Newtown, and, and uh, the, actually one of the teachers reached out to us and uh, arranged it. And we went, and one of my coworkers, uh, Paula Reed, we went for a couple days. And for two days in a row, we, we sat around this large table in a bed and breakfast. And we just talked and we answered their questions and shared our experience and uh, it was powerful. I, w I realized that they had a lot of questions and I was surprised how many I could answer just because of what we had been through. And it, it was a really uh, just a great connection for both of us, the, both communities. And has, we have since stayed in touch with quite a few of those, the staff members. And uh, it was something that really impacted me and I recognized that that I really liked doing that work. If I wanted to do it, though, I, I recognized that I also had to be in a really good place because it, uh, who wants to walk into that room, you know, and sit with those people? And it's not something that I think most people would, would uh, think about doing. But and since then, uh, I've worked with, uh, at my Umpqua Community College, there was a pretty uh, horrific shooting there, um, Marysville Pilchuck High in Washington, uh, Freeman High School in Washington State, uh, I know a few people from Virginia Tech, and so over the years, this collection of, of people I've come in contact with has been completely unexpected, and travel and do a lot of that whenever I can, and uh, uh, most recently did the, was on a panel for school safety for the Congressional Black Caucus, and uh, so things like that, I just, I could just never script, it's just, uh, same with this film, I was never supposed to be in the film. And uh, Laura wanted to shoot footage. She gets some interior shots. And so she asked Frank, and Frank said, well, she can do it over the summer if you chaperone. So I was a chaperone, and we were talking about some of the stories, and they were talking about um, the food fight uh, conversation. And I said, oh, well, that's not quite how I remember it, you know. And so my perspective as a teacher, and I think it was Joe, the cameraman. Laura's unclear on this, but... Uh, Joe said, you know, Laura, I think we should get some of this. <laughs> and so uh, we did a couple interviews during the course of that, and I really never expected anything to come of it. Laura, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me here. I'd like to know, first of all, what, what did you learn uh, from doing this movie? And, and before you answer, I'll mm -hmm. give you a second thing. You really did a fabulous job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, God, what I learned a lot about myself. Um, going through this process, and it was definitely um, a healing process. 
through six years of um, talking to other classmates and just being in the school was helpful for me. Um, and I'm just, you know, I'm glad I, I got through it. And I'm glad that it's finished and it's out there and then it's, you know, it's up to the, to the audience to make of it, you know, to take what they want from it. What do you, uh, I mean, certainly I, I'm sure an experience like that was cathartic, but it strikes me it, it had to be traumatic too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I didn't, you know, I went in thinking it wasn't going to be. Um, and I quickly learned that, you know, watching, reviewing footage, for example, um, you know, as a filmmaker, that's part of your job, is to look for footage. And but when it's that personal, it's, there's some stuff that hits you. And you know, maybe the film took a little longer to make because of that, um, and some of those issues. But again, you know, being back in the school was was rough that first day, because that was the first time I was back since I graduated. Right. It also um, comes out in the film in terms of of your, you know, the the, the people you feature in the film, uh, watching them being back uh, in the school. How did you select uh, your your participants? Um, for the, I started with people that I knew um, best in high school, um, and that was Amy. We did not take cover until the janitor came over and yelled from over there, like, "Get down, get under the table." So we all get under the table. I, I kind of remember like them coming in, but I don't. I don't know exactly what like I saw or didn't see. You know what I mean? I feel like I remember seeing them, but I'm like trying to figure out if that was in the parking lot or if it was like out here. I remember somebody walking down the stairs and seeing what was happening and running back up. And right after that happened, like all you saw was like a swarm of people just like running. She was sort of the guinea pig. Um, not 100% on board, but um, after a while she she got on board. <laughs> no, she did a great job. Yeah, and there was really no turning back at, the, at that point. Um, and then Gus, I mean, Gus loves telling his story, so that was kind of an, an easy one. He's a performer. He's definitely a performer. And, you know, he doesn't mind sharing his experience, and he's been back to, to the school to share that as well with students. And then um, Jamie was last on board, but Jamie and I swam together as kids. So just kind of wondering where everybody was, was in their process after graduating. For information on how to help promote civil and mutually respectful discourse and support expansion of the distribution of our programs, please email info at harbortv.com. The Rex Al Broadcaster of the Year Award recognizes an individual who through leadership, skill, and dedication is advancing the broadcast industry in our state and our nation. Tonight, we honor Aaron Harbour. Aaron has uh, worked extensively in the media as a host, producer, political, and economic commentator and columnist. Today, the Aaron Harbour Show is the focus of his media involvement. Aaron, it is a privilege to present you with the Rex Howe Broadcaster of the Year Award. Congratulations. Just make journalism great again. The Aaron Harbour Show may be viewed 24-7 at no charge from any location in the world at www.harbortv.com. I'm with Rebecca Wilson Case. Rebecca, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Well, it's great having a mental health expert uh, on the program. So I, I'm really curious, uh, just if, you know, stepping back from just the specifics of Columbine, but in, in your own work and your own analysis in general, um, why do you think we people do the kinds of things that, that happened at Columbine and, has, and have happened elsewhere? Mm -hmm. Why do we do things like this to each other? Yeah, that's a very complicated question. Um, what we know from the research that has been available profiling mass shooters is that 
mental illness is by far not the leading cause or predictor for um, when we're looking at the profile of a mass shooter. Um, profiler, profiles for mass shooters tend to be made up of a complex array of variables being biological, psychological, physiological, and sociological factors. Um, having a mental illness certainly is not a predictor that one is going to commit a mass shooting, and mass shootings do not happen because of mental illness. Um, we do, I think, see that we could argue that mass shooters are certainly not the epitome of mental wellness, but we cannot say that um, a mental illness is necessarily the reason that a mass shooting takes place. Um, I think that we're far from really understanding fully why these things happen, uh, just because it's such a complex array of factors. Well, in terms of predictors, or, or, or co at least starting with common variables, mm -hmm. uh, certainly one is gender. Yes, yes. Um, and so talk a little bit about that in mm -hmm. terms of your, your sense of, of why almost all uh, mass shootings uh, are committed by, uh, by men, mm -hmm. uh, generally, and younger men. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, you know, I think that what we see from the research is that, yes, men are much more likely to commit a mass shooting. And we tend to see that these individuals have had a bit of an isolative nature, um, have detached from social connections and um, social circles. And really, as human beings, we are social animals. We are driven to attach. And, you know, one of the most important factors in contributing to resiliency after a traumatic event is connection, connection to others. Likewise, on the opposite side, detachment and isolation from others poses significant risks. Um, you know, I mean, we see in prisons, for example, um, being stuck in solitary confinement is really a torturous and horrific thing to do to somebody. And so I think that there's a piece of isolation that goes along with this population. And being a male, there's certainly cultural stigma and variables related to, is it okay to seek help? Is it okay to reach out to others? Is it okay to talk about your feelings? Um, and so I think that there's some of those complexities layered throughout that, that issue and dynamic. So in, in some, uh, some instances, certainly, I mean, when you going back to mental health briefly, mm -hmm. uh, clearly uh, there seems to be a much higher incidence of mental health among uh, people who commit these kinds of crimes, at least from a layperson's perspective, mm -hmm. of course, because the assumption is there's got to be something wrong with you to begin with if you do something like right. this. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, my guess is that mental health is a predictor. It just may be a really low-level predictor. Mm. Um, and so when you talk about the isolation uh, effect, for example, how do we address that? What, what can we do uh, to, uh, I mean, obviously, there are a lot of people. You go, half the kids in high school feel isolated. Mm -hmm. uh, and even kids who are popular feel isolated. So mm -hmm. how, how do you make that distinction, especially at, at that age. I mean, when you're in yeah. middle school, high school, which uh, can be great years for a lot of kids, but for many, many are, are really difficult years. Yeah. Well, I think two things. First off is, is that um, individuals who have committed a mass shooting, I think it's about 3% somewhere within there um, have an actual psychiatric history, meaning that they have been treated for a mental illness at some point in the past. So the majority of mass shooters have had no diagnosable psychiatric history, no history of being treated for mental illness, and no indicators that they truly have a mental illness such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, um, something of that nature. Now, there are some exceptions, of course, to that rule. It's not black and white. However, then in regards to your how does, question... How does 3% compare to the general... What percent of the general population has had a treated disorder? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know that statistic. Okay, we'll find Actually, out. The top so of don't my worry. Head, yeah. yeah, so... Um, but then speaking to just this connection challenge, right? How do we connect in today's world? And you know, it's really interesting that in line with social media, right, and smartphones and our obsession with technology these days, we can be more connected but more isolated than ever before, right? Because we're not having to actually connect with each other as you and I are right now, right? We go onto Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or what have you to connect, and we're missing the real lifetime connection that's happening right in front of us. So I think that there is a challenge encompassed with just the culture that we live in today, and how do we find opportunities to meaningful, meaningfully connect? Um, you know, the NAMI, the National Alliance for Mental Illness, the Arapahoe Douglas chapter, um, is working on some of this, of starting to brainstorm how do we really create 
meaningful opportunities to connect in today's world. How can we do a better job of identifying kids that could be on a path towards violence? Well, that's well, probably one of the most difficult things you can do because you can't profile a mass violent uh, attack, whether it's in schools or our workplace. What we can do, though, is identify kids that we don't allow them to fall through the cracks, that we intervene, whether it's through threat assessment or student assessment, looking for those kinds of signs and then providing the resources they need, whether we can do it in schools or whether we need outside agencies. When we do that, we are far more successful in putting that child or that young adult back onto a path of not only getting uh, through school and getting grades and passing, um, but being productive citizens in life. It's those interventions that we do at the school level and working with families that will prevent these things from happening in the future. And when we, can, when we do that, we can identify the mental health issues that we've seen uh, probably more prevalent in the last 10, 15 years, uh, maybe because of the attention on these, these horrific acts than we've done in the past. One of the challenges, it seems, there, there often is a common theme, not with every uh, school shooter or mass shooter, but uh, one of isolation. Uh, how do I mean? But when you think of middle school or when you think high school, you know, half the kids right. feel or more feel isolated. How do, how do you uh, identify someone who needs help? And is a school? Uh, what, what kind of position is a school in to help? And, and when you look at, at teachers who have classes with you know 30, 35, sometimes 40 kids, this seems to be an extraordinary challenge. I mean, just getting through the day is tough enough. It is, and you know, it's interesting, they did a study shortly after, a couple years after the Columbine tragedy, when they tried to identify or profile the, these types of individuals that would carry out these acts. And every high school had, had a, a child like that. I mean, your high performing schools and even your most lowest performing schools had children that would fit a certain profile. So you have to throw that out the window. Um, what you look at then, and it is a challenge for schools, partly because uh, the resources that are needed for it. I think when it comes to mental health issues today, it's the lack of resources trained individuals that can intervene. So you look for signs, um, whether they're very outwardly signs or inwardly. I mean, teachers are amazing people, and people who work in schools, they see students every day. I and mean, kids are spending more time in school than anywhere else other than the home. Um, and so the, the staff that are in a school, They've become uh, their second adult, or the, or the mentor. They identify kids. And when, they, when you see something, say something along that mode, you intervene when you can and provide certain resources, whether the school can do it or not. Is it a challenge? It's an extreme challenge. And like you mentioned, whether you have class sizes of 20 or 30, the idea is how do we continue to do our best to help? And we need resources. We need more people that are trained in spe specific mental health illnesses. Our guidance counselors are used today for career counseling, pathways to graduation and career. Um, and many of them do have the training to intervene. We need more psychologists, more social workers, and more counselors in schools. There's a huge shortage in this country of mental health professionals. Psychiatrists have become basically uh, medicine dispensers, drug mm -hmm. dispensers, yeah. and, and so many of them do almost no counseling whatsoever, a minimal amount to assess right. what someone needs uh, in, in terms of medications. Right. Psychologists in many parts of the country, tremendous shortage. Why haven't we addressed that? Because this situation isn't new. This has been going right. on for many years, and so even when a school identifies a problem, often schools really don't, within the system or even outside the system, don't have anyone to turn to. What can we do about that? And, and why haven't we done something about that? Well, I think we're doing some things about it. I think the why we're seeing so much more of it is the conversations is these things continue to happen. Bad stuff happens. And I think when we see the Parklands and the Sandy Hooks and all these that, that have occurred since Columbine, it's still relatively very small, as you, as you noted originally, um, in the grand scheme of things. However, the more you, un, uh, you do not tend to those kinds of students that are struggling, be, are more disenfranchised, disengaged, or have all kinds of issues, the likelihood of them to turning to violence is, is much greater. So what we, I believe what we need to do is, like you said, we need more people to train. Psych psychologists shouldn't be administering medicine. What they should be doing is assessing and helping to get kids and to work through those issues. There are lots of successful stories we don't see in media. They're really in our communities about kids that we've been able to turn around. We do hear about those kids that are uh, turned to guns and other violence because that, that's the news in that community. There are lots of other success stories. We're a long way from, from ever being where we can feel comfortable, but we're doing more and we do better because we have more training and more access to the resources that are there. If schools don't have those resources, 
there are communities that do provide it, whether through communities or county or even state agencies. And we do have those partnerships that are very valuable. You know, uh, one of the things, clearly as a teacher, uh, you're expected to be strong. You're expected to be the pillar of strength and someone everyone else can lean on, especially in terms of, of students. Yeah. Uh, but if, at the same time, obviously, you were, you were traumatized and, and you were falling apart. Uh, tell me about that, that dichotomy uh, and, and the dissonance of, of having to, to you know, be the one people could lean on and right. really ready to lie down on the floor with the lights off. Oh. It felt like at the time that school and being in my classroom was the place I could keep it together. Uh, it felt like once I made it in from my car into the building, I, I could, there was just that, I could let loose, just like, oh, I made it. And, but it was much more difficult out, out in the world and at home. And so I poured myself into work and, and, and the students and everybody was highly damaged and impacted. And, and uh, I was also coaching a, a lot, so the, just tremendously long days, just immersed myself in that, I think, as I thought it was going to help me and have, help them. And then uh, when I was, I'd go home, and um, I was just tatters. You know, my family got the leftovers. Uh, I was often sleeping, um, even on the weekends. If, you know, if I didn't have a game or something, I was probably sleeping. And uh, I was just really unavailable to cope with very much in the world other than you know, what was inside of my classroom. So uh, yeah, it was, it was an incredibly difficult time. I think I isolated from, you know, a lot of, from you know, uh, friends outside of school and family. And so it, uh, it, it's just sort of kind of chipping away at everything, really. I remember Frank going down the hall, and I remember I could see down at the end of the hall, I could see the silhouette of a gunman holding a rifle. And I could hear gunshots, but it wasn't that person's because he was holding it upright like this, and I could hear gunfire, and, but it was rapid fire, so I knew that it was somewhat automatic or automatic. What about uh, your therapy? What, what was special about your therapy? Well, uh, <laughs> you know, when, those, when these things happen, a lot of their therapists and counselors come in, descend upon the community and the school, and not all of them are probably equipped for that kind of a trauma, and I remember I had a I met with one of the counselors at school, and, and I was telling her about I was having a bunch of symptoms that I didn't really understand them yet, and uh, I was explaining them to her, and she said to me, "Well, maybe, maybe you just after school, you just, I want you to just go home and have a nice cup of chamomile tea," and that just enraged me. <laughs> I remember, like. You know, kind of like pounding on the table and re elevated my voice and I was like, I don't want any chamomile tea. I want, some, I want something that's going to work now. I want something that's going to fix this. And I, I, I was in a horrible place and there was just felt like there was no relief and there's no, you know, magic pill. And uh, so eventually I went to uh, Columbine Connections. Was, uh, it was a counseling center that had been set up over by the mall kind of people could do drop-in stuff. And so eventually I went there. Set up specifically? For the, yeah, it was uh, funded by money that had been you know, gifted to the community from all over the country. And so I went over there and uh, I just happened to, when I went to sign in, met this woman, um, Margaret McCormick, and uh, she was a trauma counselor and she was amazing. She, she seemed to know exactly where I was at. She could tell me where I had been and where I was going to go. And she was, she was wonderful. And uh, I did some of that DMDR therapy, which you know, sounds like completely like voodoo to anybody who hears about it for the first time. And uh, did a lot, just a lot of you know, talking through. And uh, she always gave me homework. And I wanted to understand what was happening to my brain. And I think Marguerite recognized that. So she would give me information on you know, how trauma impacts the brain and the body and your health. And, and it really, I, I just began to get those, you know, one foot in front of the other and kind of begin to make that uh, return to the closest thing to normal. So what do you think we can learn, especially uh, as parents, uh, from the movie? 
Well, as parents, I think um, one of the best lines in the film that I always draw from is what Jamie said, which is, we did the best that we could. And as a student, um, as a college, um, high school student, you know, you're just, you're trying to do your best, but there are pressures in life and, you know, preparing for college, whatever, just going to school, getting good grades. And I think, you know, for myself, I can speak to, I was, um, a, you know, immersed in that and felt that pressure. And then when something like Columbine happens, it's like, you just feel like you're not doing anything right, you know? Um, it can feel that way. And then as an adult, I heard Jamie say to me, um, you know, interviewing her, we did the best that we could. And that was the first time I had heard that. And that was uh, really comforting to hear at, you know, someone that age to just tell your kids, you know, do the best you can. All right, two last quick questions, sure. not easy questions. Uh, when you look at the rate of uh, school incidents or shooting incidents in, in this country and compare it to any other industrialized country, uh, the difference is just stark. Um, mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Uh, you know, there's, it's interesting. I'm often asked that question, and, and a lot of times people will move then right to the gun, gun rights, and then uh, some will move to mental health, and some will even go after media. And I think the reality is that we've seen a breakdown of family structures. In my uh, 28 years working in public education, I've seen a, a breakdown in family structures. I've seen uh, more students that, str that struggle with day-to-day uh, -day needs, whether it's food or shelter, um, even in a suburban school district where I'm at today those needs have to be addressed. And so we have to build coalitions and partnerships and collaborations with our community agencies, our, our faith communities, because it truly goes back to the, 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 the African proverb, it does take a village. So when we have those in place, we can, we can maximize that social capital, if you will, that people then focus on the needs of our kids and our community, not just uh, kids, but young adults that struggle too. We have lots of college students. I have kids in college that they, they deal with the same thing. They're just a little bit more uh, complex brains and so they can understand some of the things they're dealing with. Unfortunately, a lot of it is then we turn to certain uh, types of drugs to deal with it. And I think more of that has to, we have to get away from that and more focus on the family structures, the community structures. If there are broken families, let's cover that through our community structures. One of the interesting things I noticed in, in the movie is your decision to not mention uh, the attackers, the killers, or, or even those who uh, were, you know, there's no focus on, on those who were killed or, or, or injured. Tell me about your thought process about that. Um, honestly, well, the, so not mentioning the, um, the shooters, that was deliberate. Um, I just didn't want to, you know, glorify that or be, have that be the focus. And I didn't know them. Um, again, I was a freshman, so just trying to get from point A to point B. Um, and I didn't have any interactions with them, so I didn't feel like I could speak on that topic. And then um, the victims, I'm not going to lie, I'm not happy about. I think there is still time to put that, that in the end, honestly, as, you know, as some text on screen or something. I just wanted to focus on what we knew, which was the freshman class and, and the kids that were there and the ones that were willing to talk. Um, and I think it's hard to get people that are in a different space, um, maybe not in the best place to talk about their experience. It's hard to get them on camera. Um, so I just, I wanted to focus on what we knew, have it be in our, in our own words and, and then go from there. Please contact us. We want to hear from you. And thanks for watching.